Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So I'm going to attempt to be concise, which I understand is an unusual thing for me, but we're going to talk about distal taper. Um, and the reason that I think this needs to be spoken about, we need to discuss this, is because I think distal taper is something which is actually widely misunderstood. Not only misunderstood by people in general talking about swords on channels like this, uh, but also misunderstood by a lot of sword makers. Uh, now, the fact of the matter is, is that I've been studying swords, historical examples, including antiques, and obviously I am an antique dealer. I've been studying original swords, including medieval swords and surviving ones, um, since I was in my mid to late teens. Um, and that includes doing things like going to uh, the Park Lane Arms Fair and studying the uh, statistics of um, published examples in the Park Lane Arms Fair catalogues um, by people like my friend Clive Thomas and indeed by people like you at Oakshot um, before him. Um, and of course with uh, modern antiques I have hundreds of uh, antiques come through, perhaps even thousands, uh, come through my hands every year um, and so I get the chance to study those. Now, what is the misunderstood thing here? Well, the misunderstood thing is that distal taper, for anyone who doesn't understand, that means, uh, and, and I understand there might be some arguments about the terminology, but this is how it's widely used in the modern sword community. Distal taper is how the thickness varies along a blade. And this can apply to any blade. It can apply to a medieval European arming sword like this uh, Albion Lancaster, or it could um, apply to a Japanese katana, or it could apply to a 19th century or 18th century sabre or backsword, um, a tolwa, all sorts of things. So basically it could apply to knives as well. So any type of blade, when we talk about distal taper, i.e. something having distal taper, which is a kind of bad description in a way, but it's something having distal taper, that means usually that it starts off thick here and gradually gets thinner. Hopefully most people watching this channel understand what distal taper is. Now the misunderstanding is that lots of people regard something as that has distal taper as good and something that um, doesn't have distal taper as bad and that's incorrect. The simple fact is that some historical types of sword and knife don't have much distal taper at all or sometimes don't have any. Um, equally some types of sword pretty much to function as they should uh, and work as they should have to have distal taper. Now what a lot of modern manufacturers um, get wrong most commonly is that they don't put distal taper onto a blade that really should have distal taper. Now there are some types of blade which fundamentally can look similar and may or may not have varying degrees of distal taper and one of those examples is the Japanese katana. So Japanese katanas are massively uh, reproduced in the modern world, mostly made in China in Longquan, um, but, uh, and, but you know they are made elsewhere as well. And if you look at original katana and wakasashi blades or indeed um, tachi and um, or, or other forms of Japanese blade, some of those blades have have distal taper, in other words they get thinner, and some of them have really almost negligible uh, distal taper. So despite the fact the blades can look similar, sometimes they have distal taper and sometimes they don't, and the degree of distal taper they can have can vary. Generally speaking, Japanese swords by uh, European standards are quite thick. They tend to be quite thick. Interestingly, there seems to be some tendency that earlier Japanese swords seem to have a more notable or more uh, frequent distal taper than uh, later ones do. But that's a topic for a different video and possibly from a different person who's more expert in Japanese blades. Now coming to European swords. So I made the point that some swords have distal taper and some don't. A good example of a sword which has I would just use the technical term here, a buttload of distal taper, is the Albion Ring Egg that I've got here. Now we're going to look at some actual stats in a minute. I have my trusty digital uh, ca uh, calipers, so we're actually going to measure some quickly. I'm not going to make this into a long, boring measuring video, hopefully, just to give you an idea of the sort of distal taper and the sort of tapers that we are or aren't talking about. This has an absolute buttload of distal taper. And that is because it is intrinsic to this type of blade working. What we have here is a relatively narrow, 
and tapering but very stiff blade. For this to not handle like a crowbar but for it to be stiff enough to do the job that it's intended to do, that is being used by armoured people um, potentially to stab through or into male armour and also in gaps in plate armour, potentially used in half sorting, that is uh, gripping or supporting the blade halfway up, it needs to be a stiff blade. This isn't the best cutter in the world, it's never going to be. This type of sword is a compromised design and it is designed for a particular job or a particular task. If you hit people hard with it, it will wound them and kill them. Uh, it might not cut as well as a talwar or a falchion, um, but it will cut well enough. Um, but what it can do better than those aforementioned swords is it can thrust into uh, resistant uh, materials and into small gaps and it is stiff, a super stiff blade. This is a thick sword and we'll look at that in a minute and it has a lot of distal taper. However, if we look at a different type of sword, this one, I don't even think you've seen this on camera before. It is a Sudanese Cascara. So you've seen this type of sword, but not this particular example. Now, why am I suddenly throwing an African sword into the mix? Well, quite simply, the blades on these are often made in Germany. So these German Solingen made blades were exported to, oh, in fact, all over the world, but they were imported amongst other places to the Sudan in North Africa, um, and they were put onto these cascara hilts. This isn't a medieval crusader broadsword. This isn't a survivor from uh, the medieval um, period or the crusade or anything like that. It's just simply an in indigenous style of um, sword that was used by various Islamic people um, and survived in the Sudan, uh, specifically used by certain tribes such as the Beja, Hadendawa and these kinds of people, and were encountered by the British Army in their uh, colonial exploits of the 1880s um, through to 1900. So this type of blade, often German made, often European, also copied in the Sudan, but this type of blade is broad, as you can see, much, much, it's not tapering like these, um, these types of swords. It's broad and quite flat and quite thin. And this blade does not have a lot of distal taper, but it is quite thin. We'll look at some measurements in a little bit. Um, then we get onto certain other types of swords, which this is a type 18, so you'll see it's more of a bowed out edges than those kind of type 15s that I've been showing. Um, and it, so it is broader, but it is also pointy, and it has a hollow ground midrib blade. Now this is obviously a replica. This is um, made by Mark Vickers in this case, but it is quite representative of some originals that exist and that's why I'm using it here, same as the Albions. The Albions, this Mark Vickers, um, and uh, I'm going to be looking at a Dark Sword Armoury Sword as well, they are all representative of original um, statistics, and that's why I'm using them, despite the fact that they are replicas. I'm using them as evidence because they are based on, or very closely uh, representative of originals that do survive in collections. And this blade doesn't have an awful lot of distal taper, but it is a, nevertheless a very stiff blade by virtue of the fact that it's got more meat in the blade in terms of width up here, and it's got that midrib. We'll have a look at the stats for that in a minute. Um, uh, this is similar to that. It is a Type 15 blade, um, but as you may have seen if you saw the review for um, the first review for the Dark Sword Armoury Swords that I've received, this does have quite notable distal taper. We'll have a look at that. So the long and the short looking at medieval blades. Oh, another example here. Let's not forget all the examples. So this is another broad blade. This is the Albion Clontarf. Um, and this is a very broad blade, relatively uh, flat blade um, with not a huge amount of distal taper, but with some. OK, so there's variation. So the, the headline for those earlier period or earlier style European cut and thrust blades is that some have distal taper, some don't. And it's related to how the sword, how the blade is intended to be used and what you're requiring from it, what type of targets it's likely to encounter and these kind of things. Now, we're also going to throw in some uh, later European uh, sabres, military swords into the mix, 1796 like cavalry sabre, 1845 pattern um, infantry officer's sword or sabre, um, and those pretty much universally have notable distal taper, okay, they have, they have marked distal taper and are much thicker at the base here, much thinner at the tip up here. Now, Obviously there are lots of considerations to do you want distal taper, don't you want distal taper, but what I really want to emphasize to uh, particularly modern 
makers of, of blades is that a significant proportion of European swords do have distal taper. Um, that is, they are thicker at the base of the blade and they gradually get uh, narrow, um, thinner as you go down towards the point. Um, that distal taper can be linear or non-linear. That is, the gradient, if you drew it, on a, drew it on a graph, if you're going from one centimeter to two millimeters, so 10 millimeters to two millimeters, it doesn't necessarily get thinner at a, at a steady rate. Sometimes um, you will find that it suddenly gets thinner, then stays the same for a long time, and then suddenly gets thinner again. That's often the case with sabers, okay? And we'll look at that in, in a minute. Um, but if you're not putting distal taper onto a blade, then there need to be a specific set of criteria for not having distal taper. The general rule is that distal taper is desirable for handling characteristics and performance of a lot of types of sword and is present in a huge number of um, original, antique and surviving um, sword blades, be it from the ancient world, from you know Roman Gladius or Spatha, all the way through medieval, early medieval and, and later medieval swords through the Renaissance, very particularly the case if we're looking at things like so-called side swords um, and rapiers, broadswords and backswords, they usually have distal taper. And the times when we find no distal taper or minimal distal taper, as I say, it has to fulfill a certain set of criteria to do with the blade. And it's usually in Europe associated with a broad blade, a broad cutting blade um, of something like that. Okay, right now, Let's have a little look at the um, stats on these things. So first up, I'm going to do that Dark Sword Armoury Sword because I know that that's got uh, fairly even distal taper down the blade. So at the base of the blade, this uh, Dark Sword Armoury Long Sword, two-handed sword, is 7.1 millimetres, which is pretty representative of a lot of uh, medieval um, long swords at the base of the blade. It's not especially thick. It's certainly not thin. Um, looking at originals, and bearing in mind I've looked at a lot of these um, reports and statistics for original medieval swords, uh, whether one-handed sword or two-handed sword, it is rare to find a blade that is in less than 4.5 or 5 millimeters thick at the base of the blade. Okay, very rare to find a blade that's thinner than that at the base of the blade. Seven or seven plus millimeters is quite common, uh, especially for a longer blade like this. Okay, we move, um, let's say about um, a foot up the blade, 30 centimeters up the blade, 6.6 .6 millimeters. Let's move about another 30 centimeters up the blade, 5.3 millimeters, and move up to just a few centimeters below the tip, 3.4 millimeters. So that's fairly linear distal taper, and that is nice. That leads to nice handling, nice stiffness. It's a good compromise between um, weight reduction versus nimbleness at the tip versus still having a blade that's quite stiff. Remember the place where you want the greatest thickness in the blade is always at the base of the blade to produce the thickness. Think about a triangle. Think about how stable a triangle is as opposed to a rod. Okay. Um, now if we go to on the surface what you might think is a similar sword but is actually not particularly a similar sword at all is the Albion Ringek. The Albion Ringek is a particularly pointy and stiff blade and I was surprised when I first measured the base of this blade um, because what I wasn't prepared for it is nine millimeters at the base of the blade. That is robust, very robust and again looking at original stats you do occasionally find thicker ones, about one centimetre or ten millimetres thick at the base of the blade, but nine millimetres is pretty representative of a stiff, uh, very stiff blade. Let's move about thirty centimetres up the blade. It goes down to 6.9 millimetres, so it's now down to near enough seven millimetres after only uh, 30 centimetres. So it, it quite rapidly narrows down uh, to begin with, and so that means that you're not making the blade um, you're just getting a huge amount of stiffness at the junction between the tang and the blade, but you're not having a huge amount of unnecessary weight. If we move another 30 centimeters up the blade, measure again, uh, then we're down to 5.6 millimeters. But notice, even up here, at pretty much at the center of percussion, that's still 5.6 millimeters. And some of the lower end and cheaper replica swords that you'll find around are only five millimeters thick down at the base of the blade. 
Um, so the fact that this Albion is 5.6 millimeters all the way up here at the center of percussion, that's still really, really thick by sword standards overall, global sword standards, to have something that's 5.6 millimeters thick at the center of percussion, at the cutting portion of the blade, is pretty damn thick. Let's move up to about six inches down from the point, it's down to 4.5 millimeters. Again, some cheap replicas out there are 4.5 millimeters for the entire blade, which means that they're very floppy and don't have any stability and they don't handle nicely. And even right up near the tip, only an inch down from the tip, we're still at 4.3 millimeters. So this is really, this Albion is really a, a, a bar, really. And you know, you at Oakshot described some of these swords, particularly the type, uh, type 17 in his type, typology, as being a bit crowbar-like. And I have to say, the Albion Ring Ek doesn't handle wonderfully. It, what it lacks in distal taper, shall we say, although it has a lot of distal taper, but what it lacks in kind of getting thin, shall we say, at the tip of the blade, it makes up for in this what I'd call profile or silhouette taper. It is a very pointy blade. So in terms of overall mass, if we're just talking about ma amount of material, it does lessen a lot as you go along the blade. And that's where you get a relatively nice handling, but it, nevertheless, it's a fairly you can feel it's got quite a lot of authority and mass up here, but the mass doesn't convert to cutting potential because it's not a broad and flat blade that's gonna cut well through targets. This is a really quite stiff and thrust centric blade. Again, not to say that you can't still do very effective uh, cuts with it, which you can, cuts which are gonna do enough, but it's never gonna cut uh, like a broader or thinner, flatter blade. Um, Right, so now let's switch over to what's fundamentally a similar blade, pipe, blade type, but bear in mind this is a lighter, smaller sword. This is an arming sword, it's a one-handed sword. So you might expect there to be a huge difference between the long sword, despite the fact there isn't necessarily a huge amount of blade of, of reach difference. The long sword's only, what, about four, five inches longer maybe than the arming sword. Um, but nevertheless, let's, uh, and it, this is broader at the base as well, so we'd expect it to being broader, it doesn't need to be quite so thick. And indeed, this is six millimeters at the base of the blade. Now, in my experience looking at existing arming swords from this period, I've looked at the Castillon swords, for example, of which this is loosely based on, um, and six millimeters is representative. That is a good average thickness for what an arming sword of this type, type 15, uh, well, possibly you could call this a type 18, it's somewhere between a 15 and an 18, but anyway, uh, six millimeters is quite representative of what you'd expect for the thickness at the base of a blade in this period, or indeed um, for the 14th or 16th century as well. Um, six millimeters isn't especially thick, um, as you see, it's quite a bit slimmer than the uh, flatter, rather thinner than the ring egg, um, but it's only a millimeter less than the great big uh, dark sword, um, long sword. Um, but both of these are slightly broader blades and, more, and slightly more cut centric blades than the uh, Albion ring egg is. But six millimeters, again, it's rare to find any arming swords that are thinner than 4.5, five millimeters at the base of the blade. So six millimeters is good, quite representative. It leads to quite a stiff blade, but it's good handling. Um, now let's just move up the blade and see. So about 30 centimeters up, it goes down to five millimeters. Then same again, it goes down to four millimeters, quite linear. So six, five, four, and then right near the tip, it gets down to two millimeters. That's actually, actually quite surprising. It's thinner than I thought it'd be. So, um, so there we go, six, five, four, and at some point three, and then two. So this is quite linear distal taper. So we've got taper in this direction, we've got taper in this direction, with the result that this is a very, you know, despite the fact it's quite a, a meaty sword, it's not particularly light, it's got good handling because all of the, the mass is really centered back here and it gets less and less and less, you know, it gets more and more drawn out in terms of the amount of material towards the tip in both forms of taper. So, uh, so far we've seen swords with quite a lot of distal taper. Now here's a sword that throws a um, curveball into the mix and admittedly 
this is a replica and so some of you might say oh well that's a replica so it's not necessarily um, accurate historically accurate but there are historical examples like this that follow this pattern so this is a type 15 blade it is savagely hollow ground as you can probably see from the light reflecting off the blade there it has a defined midrib and that's important and these swords which taper in this way often have a midrib which gives them rigidity and it's a, as I say, it's a Type 15 blade, which I personally is one of my favourite um, shapes of blade. And if we go to the base of the blade here, 6.1 millimetres. So again, we've got that, that golden arming sword, 6 millimetres. If you want to make a replica arming sword, 6 millimetre steel stock is a good place to start, or at least a, aim for You might start with a thicker stock if you're um, hammering it down, of course. If you're doing stock removal, then fine. Uh, but 6 millimetre at the base of the blade, is quite representative of a lot of 15th century arming swords. If we go, let's go a bit less, let's go about 20 centimetres up the blade here, 5.8 millimetres. So it is getting a bit down, a little bit further up. I'm going further up because it's a shorter blade, so. Um, same, because 5.8 5 millimetres, no difference. 5.8 millimetres, and then right up, this has actually got a very slightly reinforced tip. 5.5 millimeters so it goes very slightly down but basically we go to from 6 to 5.8 and then it stays 5.8 pretty much all the way along and we've actually got a slightly flared tip it goes back out i think it goes back out to six millimeters at the it does six millimeters so this is six millimeters here six millimeters right at the tip it's a bit like a rondel dagger at the tip and this is accurate to some 15th century swords and it's slightly thinner 5.8 millimeters probably just due to polishing um, but basically this doesn't have distal tape in this blade but it handles absolutely magnificently but it has quite a lot of authority um, despite its size and shape it's not it's not particularly point centric although it's pointy sword you can you can tell that um, despite its size and relatively lightweight this is going to strike with quite a lot of authority and it is a good cutter but it is stiff it, is st it achieves its stiffness through a different way and that way is by having a mid rib with a hollow ground blade so a different philosophy to blade making but that as you can see this doesn't have distal taper like the others but it has very specific reasons for not having distal taper now let's go to the antique uh, cascara so this blade is a probably 18th 19th century um, and it's and it's an export blade so but in style it is a style of blade that very much goes back to the 16th century debatably even the 15th but the 16th 17th century really and this is a type of blade that was often mounted on European cavalry swords but it was also traded abroad to places like India um, but also to Africa as well and these types of blades were um, much beloved of the Sudanese in particular and they did copy them for a long time afterwards. I can't honestly say whether this is a Solingen or a local made blade it looks like a Solingen blade from the quality of the fillers to me. It's got lots and lots of fillers and they are multiple um, and they are straight and well made. And that's usually, not always, but it's usually indicative of a German made blade. Now that is a stunning and very unusual uh, for its thinness. 3.8 millimeters 3.8 millimeters. That's incredibly thin at the base of the blade. Go up a little bit further up here. 3.4 a little bit further, 3.6 bizarrely, so it goes thinner at a certain point and then gets thicker. Uh, then up here, 2.2, 2 2.2 again, and up towards the tip, 2.2. 2.3 it says so it varies a bit that might be indicative of this being a, a local made blade rather than a Solingen made blade but as you can see it goes from from three point something millimeters and then stays in the twos right the way along here this is an incredibly look even under its own weight flexible and light blade and that does mean that it's a 35 and a half inch blade uh, switching to imperial there um, but uh, it's a it's a big long blade but it is quite floppy now you do find European swords like this occasionally. What's very interesting is, I'm gonna switch over sword here to the Lancaster. So many people are fans of the Alexandria um, type 18C uh, long swords. Now what's interesting about them is they are very, very atypical for 15th century, in their case, early 15th century swords. The blades are exceptionally broad 
and they are exceptionally thin, but also because of the proportions, because they're so broad, they're actually relatively heavy, okay? So they're relatively heavy, not particularly long, very wide, but relatively thin. And a lot of those swords, and obviously there are several surviving in different collections and also private collections, a lot of them are only about five millimeters, even perhaps even a shade under that at the base of the blade. But this is unusually thin for swords of those uh, proportions in Europe. And this has led to some uh, surmising that perhaps they were particularly made for export um, to, to Alexandria, uh, and perhaps they were not, perhaps that type of blade, that thinness, if you look at the fineness of the edge, and even modern replicas, I note that um, people like Scalagram and Matthew Jensen have found them not to be very durable blade types, certainly when encountering harder targets. In Scalagram's case, it was wood, um, but you've got to bear in mind that swords in this period, certainly in Europe, were supposed to be able to stand up to striking helmets and mail armor and bits of plate armor and other weapons, of course. And it does seem that the Type 18 C blades, the Alexandria blades, which I'll probably do a dedicated video about at some point, are particularly fragile. But anyway, they are about five millimeters at the base of the blade, usually about that. Perhaps some are as thin as 4.5 millimeters, and there are a few other medieval swords which are that thin, but that is unusual. Most medieval swords, whether they be arming swords or longer swords, are about five millimeters or thicker at the base of the blade. And most medieval swords have some degree of distal taper. Now, to finish off, let's just have a little look, uh, or to finish off for the medieval swords anyway, let's just have a quick look at the um, Albion Clontarf. So again, this is a replica, but it is a good representation of swords of the period. It's actually a bit heavier than um, quite a lot of surviving examples, but that's always a tricky topic because archeologically found ones have usually lost mass. Now that is a very broad blade, but it's only 4.6 millimeters at the base of the blade. Bear in mind what I just said for later medieval arming swords, it is unusual to get a blade which is thinner than five millimeters at the base of the blade. This blade is thinner than that, four point, maybe it's saying 4.8 now. Let's have a look this way around. Yeah, it's varying a bit depending on how, but call it 4.5, it's varying a bit. But um, it's 4.5 millimeters at the base of the blade and that is pretty thin, but look how broad the blade is. Now if we go 30 centimeters up the blade and take the thickness, it is four millimeters. Go a bit further up, it is four millimeters. Go a bit further up, it's three millimeters and near the tip, it's 2.6 millimeters. So actually, this does have distal taper, and you would expect that, but it doesn't have maybe as much distal taper as some people might think. It is important that you have some degree of distal taper, because you don't want the blade to be too floppy at the base here, like that cascara is. But that is not a huge amount of distal taper. It's going from four and a half millimeters and basically going down to the threes uh, for, for quite a bit of the blade, or basically in the fours up here, then into the threes, and then right near the tip into the twos. Um, but it's not a colossal amount of distal taper, but just that little bit makes the sword feel so much better. If you're thinking, oh, well, I could just make a flat blade that's four and a half millimeters all the way along, don't do that. If you make that kind of broad blade without the distal taper and you make it the same thickness all the way along, it will handle horribly, it will handle like a crowbar. And with such a broad blade, having some distal taper is super, super important. Now let's look at the 19th century swords. So obviously this is a leap forward in time. I don't own many um, sort of middle period, should we say, so kind of, you know, rapiers and, and uh, mortuary hilts and, and back swords and things like this. I don't own a lot of replicas of those and not ones that I trust to be close enough to originals. So I'm gonna skip forward in time. So I've gone essentially medieval swords and now I'm fast forwarding to the 19th century, although of course the cascara is 19th century, but it's a weird kind of, bit of a weird one that. Um, so first of all, we're gonna have a look at the uh, infantry officer's sword. Now, as mentioned, these uh, swords of this period usually have a lot of distal taper and rely on their handling characteristics uh, to have lots of distal taper. You simply can't make one of these with a very flat blade and have it handle anything like an original at all, despite the fact there are some replicas out there that attempt to do that 
and uh, get it wrong. Uh, one of those famous ones I don't mind stating here is the cold steel version of the 1796, which doesn't have enough distal taper. Right, this, bear in mind, this is a relatively light, probably about 800, 850 grams, um, one-handed 19th century sword. How thick do you think it is at the base of the blade? You've just heard how thick the medieval swords are. 7.4 millimeters thick at the base of the blade. That is thicker at the base of the blade than the Dark Sword Armoury big long sword. It's thicker at the base of the blade than the um, Albion Lancaster arming sword. It's thicker than the Mark Vickers um, Henry V type sword. It's basically thicker than all of them except for the Albion Ringeck. That's super thick when you think about it. Now, part of the reason for that is these blades are narrower and a lot of people have the uh, mis, uh, misunderstanding that these blades are super light and they're super narrow and super fragile. But much like if you look at katana blades, if you compare a katana blade to most medieval European blades, katanas are quite narrow. Most uh, shamshir are quite narrow, but they're quite thick. And often a narrow blade is a thick blade. And this is all to do about mass distribution and amount of material at different portions along the weapon. So 7.4 millimeters at the base of the blade. If we go about 30 centimeters up, it's already down to 5.3 millimeters. But bear in mind that 5.3 millimeters is still thicker um, than some swords that are at the base of the blade, usually ones that are too thin. Um, then we go another 30 centimeters up the blade and it's down to 3.6 millimeters. And then up near the tip, it is 2.1 millimeters. So that's a huge variation, huge amount of distal taper. And that's a good demonstration of why these types of swords, as well as the detail of the hilt construction, are very difficult to replicate convincingly because we've got a huge amount of distal taper from seven point something millimeters down to two point something millimeters in only 32 inches of blade. This is a Wilkinson incidentally, uh, but it is representative pretty much. All infantry officer swords are pretty much within this ballpark. Um, and this is a one inch wide blade. They obviously they used imperial measurements for anyone who wants to know in exact, that is 26 millimeters wide. So just over an inch. Um, so, um, you know, there we go. Huge amount of distal taper in that infantry officer's sword, uh, which dates to about 1890, that example, I think. Here we've got something uh, different. This uh, Austrian, uh, middle of the 19th century Austrian cavalry sword, unusual in that it's flat on one side of the blade and fullered on the other side of the blade, which is something the Austrians particularly liked. It does have a sort of bolster, a little bit, um, uh, uh, a little bit like how some Japanese sword and Chinese swords are mounted, but I won't measure that bit because that's not fair. I'll just measure the blade. Um, and that at the base of the blade is 7.8 millimeters. Not that different to the uh, British infantry officer sword there. 30 centimeters up the blade, it goes to, down to 6.3 millimeters. So it's maintaining a bit more beef in the blade than the infantry officer sword, which is what you'd expect. This is a big cavalry sword and quite heavy. 3.7 millimeters and then up near the tip, three millimeters. So it stays a little bit thicker up towards the tip than the uh, infantry officer sword does. It's what you'd expect. This is a heavier sword. It's a cavalry sword to be used from a horse at cavalry speed, at higher impact uh, energy and all that kind of stuff. So there we go from, from uh, what was it? 7.8, uh, yeah, 7.8 millimeters all the way down to three millimeters. A lot of distal taper. And finally, the uh, 1796, and this is the sword which probably the most number of people would like to see a good quality replica of, but all of the replicas that, all of the mass produced replicas anyway, I have seen a couple of custom made ones that were good, but all of the mass produced replicas that I've ever seen, of which the best known one is by um, Cold Steel, uh, does not have enough distal taper. The Cold Steel examples that I have seen are not thick enough at the base of the blade and they are too thick at the tip of the blade. There is a lot of distal taper in these. How much? Let's see. So let's measure the back of that blade, 8.2 millimeters. So it's 8.2 millimeters thick at the base of the blade. Let's only go up a few inches up the blade and it already goes down to six millimeters. Now that's very, very important because that means that we're rapidly losing mass, but we've got a huge amount of strength and stiffness around this very vulnerable joint between the blade and the hilt. So it already goes from 8.2 millimeters to within, uh, what is that, within, about 15 centimeters, it goes down to 5.7 millimeters, then a little bit further up around the middle of the blade, 4.6 millimeters, 
then round the center of percussion, 2.5 millimeters. 2.5 millimeters, okay? And then a couple of inches down from the tip, brace yourselves, folks, 2.3. Hold on, 2.0, no, 1.9, yes, I thought that. It twisted as I pulled it away. No, hold on, hold on, that's, yeah, 1.9. Okay, so near the tip, 1.9 millimeters, two, call it two millimeters. So huge, it goes from eight point something millimeters all the way down to two millimeters in only a 33 inch blade. Um, and you know, hence when you flex it, despite the fact that the width is pretty much equal all along, gets a little bit wider towards the tip, when you flex it, it flexes all up here uh, because that's where it's a lot thinner in the blade. And that means the handling on these, despite the fact that they're very broad uh, and even spatulate tipped, they don't handle like crowbars, like a lot of replicas do, because they've got a huge amount of distal taper. So. We're going to wrap it up there, obviously two different periods and we can fill in the, the with frog DNA to an extent the bit in the middle uh, and, and I assure you that certainly for rapiers and back swords and broadswords, and the swords that occupy this space in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, they, they fit between these two, between these two groups we've looked at here very nicely. Distal taper is incredibly important but not all swords have it. Um, certain types of sword have very little distal taper or they have non-linear distal taper. That is, they'll stay the same thickness for a portion of the blade, but they might be suddenly much thicker at the base and suddenly much thinner at the tip. And incidentally, I should point out that particularly 19th century swords, but also if we look at some of the Indian swords as well, tulwars, um, and um, well, certain other types of sword fit into this category as well. Debatably, the Type 19 blades, which inspired the Cascara from the medieval period, they are often much thicker here, then they stay more or less in the same ballpark along here, and then they get much thinner here. And that leads to very, very nice handling. So distal taper, you usually have it on historical swords, and not having it on swords that should have it is a big no-no. Um, Sometimes it's non-linear, but sometimes you don't have distal taper, but you have to have certain other criteria in place, like a mid-rib or some other design element that excuse you for not having the distal taper. I hope this has been useful for all sorts of people, um, and I'll see you really soon again for another video on the subject of swords or weapons or something to do with history. Cheers for watching, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.